Every time I've had the opportunity to spend any time with Eric Liu, he's actually moved my mind. And I was lucky enough to be with him uh, in, in DC in January, and he was speaking about sort of popular sovereignty and moral frameworks, and doing that sort of from the text of the Lincoln-Douglas debates. And it was one of those moments where my entire worldview changed and shifted. Um, I am hoping he is going to do that for you. I have now set the bar impossibly high, so he's almost certainly going to fail. Um, and so with that, please join me in really making welcome Eric Liu. That's, that's a nice reverse move there, because now the bar is really low. Um, th thank you, Jamie, and uh, thank you, everybody, for gathering here today. I'm really uh, excited to spend some time with you um, this uh, morning slash afternoon. And I got a chance uh, when I uh, came in about an hour ago to um, peek into some of the breakout conversations you've been having and uh, talking both to Jamie and to Adam um, about uh, what you all have been doing over the last couple of days. Um, it is, uh, um, it's highly motivating. Let me put it that way. Um, we're, we're gathering at a time where it just literally feels like outside these walls, if you go back to your Twitter feed, if you pay attention to the news, uh, the republic is cratering and crumbling. Uh, and yet here in this room uh, are people whose work and whose passion and whose commitment actually proves that it's not, uh, that in fact the renewal is happening, uh, that the revival is uh, in progress right now uh, of everything that we believe in, uh, both in terms of art, place, and uh, civic empowerment. And so. Uh, just to get to spend some time with you is really highly uh, inspiring and motivating. Um, I wanted to actually um, begin, uh, I don't know how many times you all have gotten a chance to do this, but uh, just to thank uh, uh, Jamie and Adam and the entire uh, Art Place America team for making this possible. <clears throat> One of the things that um, we do at the organization that I run, Citizen University, is put on uh, a conference uh, every year. And, uh, and so I feel the pain of everybody who has to uh, organize uh, these kinds of gatherings. And, uh, uh, but I also feel the, the exhilaration uh, when, you, when you trust the folks who come uh, to really inhabit it uh, and to take the frame and, to, um, and to, make, to make jazz out of a chord chart, basically. right? Um, and, and that is what clearly you all have been doing here these last few days. Um, let me just actually introduce myself a little bit uh, and give you a little bit of context uh, for the work that I do in the world and uh, why it is that I wanted to spend some time here today talking to you about power. Um, so as I mentioned, I run an organization uh, which I co-founded with my wife, uh, Janae Kane, called Citizen University. Uh, we're based here in Seattle, but we do work all around the United States, uh, and our work is all about democratizing understanding of how power works in civic life and really trying to foster and cultivate a, a, a practice and a culture of engaged, uh, powerful participation uh, in civic life. And we do that through a variety of channels and programs and activities and partnerships, uh, including with uh, Art Place uh, America. Um, and one of the ways that, um, one of, I think, the, 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 the stars around which our work orbits um, is this simple idea uh, of power. Uh, I think all of you who um, uh, got your registration bag when you came in, hopefully got a, a nice present uh, also, uh, thanks to our friends here at Art Place America. Um, no, no, I'm, I'm really grateful to the organization for making it possible for you to, to have this book. This book is both um, partly the fruit of uh, some of our labors at uh, Citizen University, but in some ways it's also uh, a sketch or a blueprint for the labors yet to come. Uh, and, and I wanted to actually unpack for you a little bit uh, the way that we've been thinking about this notion of citizen power. Um, let me just actually begin by defining terms. Uh, when, when I say citizen power, I mean something very particular. First of all, when I say citizen, uh, I'm not talking about documentation status under the immigration or naturalization laws of the United States. Uh, I, I am talking about a deeper ethical sense of what you might think of as membership in the body, being a contributor, a claimant, contributor to and a claimant of community, an owner someone who has shared responsibility for that community, right, and for the life and the health and the vitality and the creativity of that community. Uh, that notion of citizen and citizenship um, is broad and capacious, but it's not open-ended. It is, 
uh, though it's not about documents, it, is to, it doesn't kind of imply or contain uh, a certain measure of judgment about being actually someone who shows up, about being someone who actually does think that there's no such thing as someone else's problem, uh, about being someone who is uh, in temperament and behavior and action and choices large and small, a non-sociopath. Uh, and <laughs> it's worth saying that in these times, uh, uh, that, that, that citizenship is being a non-sociopath. Um, uh, and so this broader ethical sense is one that I really think is worth underscoring, uh, not only because we're talking about, and indeed in this room there are folks who uh, are and work with and are deeply engaged with uh, uh, both our undocumented uh, friends, neighbors, colleagues, family members, but of course our native communities as well. Um, uh, and plenty of other folks for whom citizenship in a strictly legal United States sense is, is a complicated or problematic thing. Um, at the same time, I want to be really clear, this notion of citizen that I'm talking about here, this broader ethical concept um, for our work at Citizen University is very grounded in the particular place and context called the United States. Uh, and that particular place and context means that every one of us here, however we got to this room, however our families came to be here, every one of us is an inheritor, a steward, a trustee of a set of ideas, a creed uh, that this country nominally was founded upon and has yet fully to live up to. Uh, and yet, nonetheless, that creed sits there, kind of arms crossed, looking at us and saying, well, you going to do it or not? You going to meet me or not? You going to live up to me or not? Right? And Jamie talked about the, how in a previous uh, gathering I talked about the Lincoln-Douglas debates and this argument between Douglas and Lincoln over uh, what Douglas was talking about, a theory of popular sovereignty, that, uh, that the highest value uh, in a democracy should just be the will of the people, and if the, which, you know, actually on the, on the surface sounds pretty reasonable, right? That seems like what most people's notions of what democracy uh, means. But uh, what Douglas, Stephen Douglas, was saying uh, was that if the people of the Kansas or Nebraska territory um, want to decide to become a slave state, then that's their will. We should let popular sovereignty be the rule. And if they think that, you know, they want to be free, great. If they think that way they want to be slave, great. But it's popular sovereignty. And Lincoln's response then was, you know, I believe in democracy, but popular sovereignty taken to that extreme is an abomination because what it does is it makes us forget that there are moral purposes to having gathered as a community in the first place. And as Lincoln put it, if slavery's not wrong, then nothing's wrong under the sky, right? Uh, and so simply having people vote in slavery or vote in dictatorship or vote in authoritarianism or vote in the stripping of the liberties of ourselves or our neighbors um, is not sufficient to say, well, that was democratic. That was the will of the people, right? This is a discourse. This is a way of thinking and talking about citizenship that was not available to my parents when they grew up in China. And in most other places in the world, there is no creed or idea that is sitting there saying, are you going to live up to me or not? There is no Chinese idea, right? There's no Chinese creed that my parents, my relatives, even those who went to Taiwan um, after the Chinese Civil War ended, um, that they're trying to hold themselves up to, right? This is a unique and exceptional thing, but it's a unique and exceptional burden for us to bear, right? So that, I'm sorry to spend a, little, a lot of time in unpacking citizens, but I think it's really worth situating ourselves uh, in this notion, both of the capacious ethical sense of citizen, but also within an American context, which means we're all carrying a burden, right? We're all questioning whether we're living up to uh, that charge. So then the other half of this phrase, citizen power. Power. What do I mean by power? I know that throughout your discussions, um, uh, issues of power, questions of influence, uh, um, have been arising um, in, in both on stage and in breakouts and offstage hallway conversations. Uh, and so let me just kind of explain very briefly what I mean when I say power. I define it very simply. I define power as a capacity to ensure that others do as you would like them to do. And you know, that prompts kind of nervous giggles in some people, right? Because it sounds a little bit ominous, like I'm going to make sure you do what I want you to do, right? And, uh, and to many people, again, especially many people who work in the fields that we work in, uh, there's sometimes a, a reflexive resistance 
to talk of power. All our associations with the word power are kind of negative. Power mad, power trip, power hungry, right? Uh, it, it, it has this negative moral valence. Uh, but the thing that I really want to insist upon is that when you look candidly at that definition, a capacity to ensure that others do as you would like them to do, then you realize this is what humans do. This is what we are doing in our personal relationships. It's what we're doing in our friendships. It's what we're doing in our relationships with neighbors. It's what we do in our workplaces, right? Uh, when these questions of what we want others to do play out in public, play out on questions of common concern, that's civic power, right? But it won't do for us simply because the word and the idea has kind of a negative moral valence for us to put our head in the sands and say, I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to look at that because that's kind of dirty, right? P part of our work at Citizen University, and I think part of our work here today, is to reclaim this idea and to really reanimate it with a sense of, uh, no, we're unafraid uh, to name power, to anatomize power, to understand power, uh, and therefore to kind of uh, couple it uh, with the responsibilities of citizenship, as I said a moment ago. So with that frame of what I mean by citizen power, I just want to situate us in, a, in our moment in history here, uh, which isn't just the last hundred plus days and the kind of tumultuousness of uh, everything that's going on in the nation's capital, uh, but really over the last few years. Because if we zoom out a little bit and zoom out actually beyond the borders of the United States over the last few years, we are blessed. I actually think it's a blessing and not a curse. We are blessed to be alive and awake and aware at a time of some of the greatest bottom-up upheavals and surges of citizen power uh, that we've seen in at least half a century, right? Uh, everything from just within the context of the U.S., Occupy Wall Street, the Tea Party, the $15 now movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, the Dreamers, uh, and that's just within the United States, the, the Bernie Sanders campaign and the Donald Trump campaign, right? All of these, even though they have very divergent policy and uh, goals and political ideologies, are part of the same phenomenon, which is that people are pushing back against concentrated, monopolized power, right? The same thing is true outside the context of the US, from the Arab Spring to the Orange Revolution to the Maidan Revolution to the Umbrella Revolution. And again, in kind of rattling off all of these movements and these visible, palpable surges of bottom-up civic power, I'm not saying that all these movements have succeeded. In fact, thus far, quite the opposite. Many of them have, have thus far stalled, right? And even those that have quote-unquote succeeded, it remains to be seen what the fruits of that success are going to be. Uh, but there is no question that we, that, but that we live in a time where received notions of what is and what's supposed to be are being upended right now. Um, and I say we are lucky, uh, not only because these are exciting times, but because these are times that are tailor-made for people who sit and live and work at the intersection of art and politics. This is our moment right now, right? And I think one of the things that is uh, incredibly incumbent upon us, I know part of the overarching theme for today in this arc of the, the conference is the theme of responsibility. Um, and I've been looking at some of the readings and texts that um, from Mary Oliver and others that uh, uh, you've gotten a chance to absorb in, in preparation for today. Uh, and one of the things that is remarkable about this moment is that it is an age of responsibility for those of us, like us gathered here in this room, who are awake and aware and conscious uh, of our own power, conscious of our capacity to make change, conscious of our responsibility to make change, right? And so, the framework that I want to share with you as a way to um, uh, both help you make sense of what you've been experiencing the last few days, but also help uh, hopefully equip you with um, uh, some energy to go back out into the world and your own homes and communities and places uh, with uh, is a very simple framework about power. Um, so uh, as you'll see in the book when you get a chance to, to peruse it, uh, I think there are three basic laws of power in civic life. And they're worth unpacking a little bit because these three basic laws yield three what I think of as imperatives for action for us. So law number one is this. Power compounds. It concentrates. Right? That, that, that's as obvious a law as there is. Yeah. Um, whether you think of it in terms of the rich get richer, um, or people who get some influence get more influence, people who get some celebrity or profile tend to get more celebrity and profile. This is the nature of complex adaptive systems. Right? And not just human systems. It's the nature of nature itself. Right? Where seeds first cluster is where more seeds cluster and where trees start to grow and where other things start to not be able to grow. Right? That is the nature of things. 
power compounds, power concentrates. In human systems, in economic systems, in political systems, power compounds into monopolistic situations, right? Uh, and again, I don't have to tell you that twice. We are in this moment right now of the great pushback because we're at the tail end of 40 years of this kind of concentration and monopolization, 40 years of radically worsening income inequality, radically worsening wealth concentration, right? And even the last eight, eight nine years of the quote unquote recovery uh, in our economy have been years in which 95% of the gains of this recovery have accrued to the wealthiest 1%. It is literally, I mean, actually the only question in our politics right now is what, why it took this long for someone like Donald Trump to get elected. Why it took this long for someone to come along and say, I don't like this game that's being played here. I'm going to knock over the game board. I'm going to knock over the table, right? Why did it take even this long after 40 years of this kind of grinding in red states and blue states across all different kinds of demographic categories uh, of people feeling squeezed this way? So we know this in our bones that power count concentrates. Well, it takes us to law number two then, which is that power justifies itself. And again, we know this. We sense this. And again, those of us who are attuned both to art and to civic power are highly attuned to this. But what law number two means is that simply in every arena, people who are in institutions that are incumbent holders of power will spin out narratives and just so stories and forms of propaganda and rationalization, economic theories, racial storylines about why it is that the people who have power have power. Right? So there was, you know, a century ago, the dominant such storyline was a storyline that you would call white supremacy, right? It wasn't just that um, there was racism, but it, it was a, a, a storyline of explanation and justification that the reason why whites should be supreme in our politics, in our culture, in our social institutions is that non-whites were incapable of fill in the blank, self-government, responsible behavior, uh, you know, economic sustainability, whatever it is, right? But that there was a narrative uh, that sometimes took on the form of pseudoscience and sometimes just took on kind of folk explanation uh, of how grandparents talk to their grandkids, um, for why things were the way they were, right? I don't mean to put this storyline of white supremacy in the past tense. It is, of course, quite with us today, um, as is a narrative and a storyline of male supremacy uh, and why it is that, you know, this is man's work and wh why is it that there are fewer women in leadership roles in the Fortune 500 or in uh, government or politics or whatever it might be, even in academia? And the answer is, well, you know, because men are better suited toward leadership, right? And the kinds of leadership that these institutions demand, the kind of bare-knuckle leadership that power requires, this is, this is a man's work and responsibility. As absurd as that sounds even coming out of my mouth, we are surrounded by millions of people who have internalized that storyline, right? As we are surrounded by people, both Democrats and Republicans, who have internalized a similarly four-decade-long narrative uh, of self-justification by power that you can call trickle-down economics, right? That we need to coddle and take care of those with the greatest amount of wealth because that's the only way we'll ever have a chance for some of their wealth to leak down to the rest of us, right? And so favor them in the tax code. Favor them in our corporate subsidies. Favor them because that's the source of true prosperity are those few rich folks at the top. There's no actual from a scientific standpoint, economic basis for that argument. It is what you might think of as a fairy tale, right? A fable. But I don't mean to quite, I don't mean to entirely to belittle it that way. Fairy tales stick. Fables stick for a reason, right? Because they provide some kind of folk explanation for why things are. And fairy tales stick in particular when there is no competing alternative fairy tale, right? It's hard to beat something with nothing. And for four decades in this country, there's pretty much been nothing to counter that storyline. Sometimes people have said it's not fair, it's not right, it's not okay that CEOs get so much more, pay, you know, uh, so, uh, make 300 or 500 times the average worker. Um, but an argument from fairness and not niceness is not quite the same as an affirmative alternative that can displace that original fairy tale, right? So all around us, we have these examples of the way that power justifies itself. Now, if all we had were these first two laws, that power compounds into these monopolistic situations and concentrates, and that number two, that power is constantly justifying itself in ways visible and, at a, at a certain point, invisible to us, then we'd be stuck in something like a doom loop, right? A pretty grim situation that, quite frankly, plenty of other societies around the world are stuck in right now. Um, and you get places like Venezuela today 
where you finally are getting a very deep pushback uh, against that kind of doom loop, um, all, all around the world, every continent, um, you have societies stuck in that doom loop. What saves us here, in theory, what saves any society or community in theory from that doom loop of laws number one and two is law number three, which is this. Power is infinite. Power is infinite. And I know even in a room like this, which is very open-minded and very kind of <laughs> creative and imaginative, uh, I, I always can feel that there's some people kind of having an internal like, what? What do you mean power is infinite, right? Here, here's what I don't mean. I don't mean that all of us are equally powerful at all times. I don't mean that anybody can become wealthy or commanding and, you know, just with a snap of a finger. What I mean is this, that it is possible, indeed, it is happening every day all around us thanks to you. It is possible for humans to generate brand new civic power out of thin air where it did not previously exist. And we do that through the magic act of organizing. Simply inviting one other human to engage you in a common endeavor toward a common end where you have to work out some common strategies and approaches um, is the work of activating power where it did not exist, awakening power where it was dormant or dead, and creating it where it was not previously present. And what makes so many people have an intuitive, I think, resistance to this notion that power is infinite um, is the intuitions that we have from the physical world, right? In physics, if we're talking about heat or energy, um, you know, the laws of thermodynamics tell us that in a closed system, if you're going to get more heat, someone in this room is going to have to get less, right? Because it's a zero-sum deal. There's no new energy being made in the universe or in the world, right? So if someone's getting more, someone else has to get less. And we have deeply intuited, especially after four decades of this kind of grinding inequality, we have deeply absorbed and internalized a scarcity mentality, a zero-sum mentality that tells you that if someone's getting more, I got to be getting less, right? And that is a law of physics. But I think the thing that is really important to remember is I'm not talking physics. I am talking civics. And in civics, you can bust out of that zero-sum thinking, right? Because in civics, if you learn how to give a public speech, if you learn how to organize your neighbors, if you learn how to use social media to make memes completely viral to activate people on a cause, if you learn uh, how to mobilize people or money or ideas in service of a cause, if you learn how to pull together artists to stretch open the imagination of citizens in a very stuck kind of situation, you haven't diminished by one iota my ability to do any of those things. I can still do all of those things too, right? Now, it may mean when I say that power is infinite, again, your, your learning how to do those things changes our relative balance of power, right? I liked it better when only I knew how to do those things, and all you people didn't know and didn't care, because I could run everything, and I could make you do what I wanted you to do. Well, darn it, now all of you are starting to learn this stuff, right? Darn it, now you're learning how to find your voice. Darn it, you're learning how to influence your policymakers and elected officials. Darn it, you're learning how to activate your neighbors and move people with ideas and art and creativity, right? For me, who is the previous hoarder of power, that's a little bit of a bummer, right? I don't get to rule over you anymore so much. But for us, as a system, as a society, this is awesome. This is a great thing for us to remember that power is infinite. And it is great when the entire society starts re remembering and reawakening to this fact that we are capable, through that magic act of organizing, of awakening and creating new power where it did not previously exist. So as I said, these three laws of power yield these three imperatives for action. And I think this is what I really want to um, frame up for the work that you're doing out in the world uh, already. So if in the first place, power concentrates and it compounds into these monopolistic, winner-take-all kinds of games, uh, then imperative number one for us as citizen artists is simply this. We've got to change the game. We'd be conscious of naming the previously rigged game, and we have to be conscious of replacing it with an alternative and re-rigging it, right? In the second place, if power is always justifying itself and spinning narratives of why it is that those who have, have, and those who have not, have not, then our imperative is therefore to change the story and to be conscious, as some of you were in a previous breakout session just an hour ago, of the ways in which these narratives and these stories, as uh, my friend Marshall Gans, the great community organizer and teacher of community organizing, kind of talks about these three nested 
stories, a story of self, a story of us, and a story of now, right? Um, that any community organizer worth her salt is really good at aligning those three stories in, in a way that awakens other people to feel like they're part of the cause or the, uh, or, or the effort that you're trying to move people on, right? Uh, but this notion of we got to change the story means, again, that we have to be conscious of the prior story. And we have to be strategic about how we undermine or replace or bypass that prior story. Well, then the third imperative is this. If the reality is that power is infinite and that we don't live in a zero-sum world, and yet so many of our fellow, fellow Americans are stuck in a zero-sum scarcity mindset, a belief that this equation is so finite and so fear-based, then our imperative is to change the equation and to be showing them through the work that we do that new allocations are possible and that these are positive sum forms of engaging people in a community. So these imperatives of changing the game, changing the story, and changing the equation are the work of being a powerful citizen. Right? You think about changing the game, well, what's an example of that? Uh, some of the work that we do at Citizen University is in this project that we call the Joy of Voting. And we started this project uh, out of a piece that I wrote a couple years ago in The Atlantic uh, that observed that there used to be in American political life, um, this really before the advent of television, this culture of robust, participatory, joyful, creative engagement around voting in elections, right? It was, it was art. It was street theater, open air debates, competing and dueling parades and concerts, bonfires, uh, toasting and feasting and fasting. It was creative placemaking ritual around elections, right? And the arrival of television and, the, of course, the arrival of different screens uh, basically killed that. But what I said in this piece was there's no good reason why those of us who are motivated to couldn't revive that great culture of joyful participatory engagement around voting in elections and to do it in a way that was place-based, community and city-based. Uh, and so the good folks at the Knight Foundation said, we agree. And last year, we launched this project in four night cities, um, Akron, Wichita, Philly, and Miami. Um, and in all those four cities, we organized artists, designers, musicians, activists, engaged neighbors, random folks, uh, to come together and to generate community-driven, locally-rooted ideas for how to activate the spirit of the joy of voting. Right? And, they were all kind, and, and they were all ideas that were kind of relevant to the place. In Akron, it was a, a theater company uh, creating plays about politics in the election that they were performing on the back of a, a pickup truck that went from neighborhood to neighborhood. Uh, in Miami, because Miami is the great party capital of the, uh, of the world, um, it was about great, creating these great all-night parties with the best DJs in town where the uh, only uh, price of admission was proof that you'd registered to vote. Um, in Wichita, it was getting uh, street artists and graffiti artists and mixtape artists to come together in the North End uh, to create uh, uh, festivals around voting participation for young people, right? In all these different, in Philadelphia, it was a scavenger hunt through colonial Old Town um, that, again, was playful, right? I tell you about this Joy Voting Project because the prior game, the prior mindset that people go into about voting is a scarcity mindset, is a mindset of the game is so rigged, there's no point in me getting involved, right? The system is so busted, my choices are so terrible, why even bother, right? Um, and it's really hard to move the dial significantly with just rational counter arguments to that feeling, right? One of the things that we've discovered, and again, one of the things that is in your bones as citizen artists and practitioners at this intersection uh, of art and power is that you, you, you get past those kinds of objections not with rational arguments, but with something that people want to be part of, right? If voting goes from eat your vegetables, do your duty, to join the club, join the party, right? Join this tradition that we're creating. Join the ritual. Don't be left out of the ritual. Then you shift the game, right? Similarly, when we think about what does it mean to change the story uh, of power, well, boy, in our work at Citizen University, and partly my, my co-founder, who, uh, who I mentioned earlier, my wife, Shanae, is a theater artist. Uh, our program manager, Ben Phillips, uh, is a theater artist. Uh, and so, so much of our work is infused not just with a sense of theatricality and um, uh, and stagecraft, uh, but is infused more deeply with an awareness of the ways in which art at all times is forming and informing the background stories that we have about what's possible in politics, right? 
Uh, and it's why at the gatherings and the conferences and the convenings we do, we bring together people like the poet Claudia Rankin or the playwright Robert Schenken or Tony Kushner or um, the visual and performance artist Carrie Mae Weems. All these people who are using their mediums, sometimes literally with words in a form that takes the you know, structure of prose or poetry and narrative, other times simply by what they embody to begin to change the story of what's possible in our politics. The way that Claudia Rankin has shifted minds about criminal justice, about race in America, about what is possible and what is tolerable and what is no longer tolerable. She alone couldn't have shifted American attitudes. She arrived on the scene with her book Citizen at the same time that Black Lives Matter arrived on the scene, at the same time that Michelle Alexander wrote The New Jim Crow, at the same time that people both on the left and the right started finding common cause in rolling back this prison industrial complex. A lot of things had to converge here, right? But artists have been at the very center of changing the story of what's happening. And creative placemakers who think about how they apply art to changing the story of a neighborhood, changing a story of what is this place? What are we? Who are we? Are at the forefront of this work. And finally, in thinking about changing the equation, I think one of the most powerful examples of this that come to mind um, is somebody who I imagine many of you know, Judy Baca, uh, a muralist uh, in LA who's the creator of uh, something called the Great Wall of Los Angeles, this three quarters of a mile long mural made over the course of decades by essentially young people who have been written off, young people who have been discarded, ex-gang members, potential gang members, young people without access to opportunity, young people who uh, in many cases are either immigrants or children of immigrants um, on the margins of society in Southern California. Uh, and they've created this three quarters of a mile long mural that not only depicts a fully inclusive multicultural vision and history of California and the country, but is itself a, def a demonstration of the idea that you can change the equation, that all of these isolated, atomized, discarded, invisible individuals, once given a paintbrush, once given the scaffolding, once given instruction of how to actually tell the story of your family or your people or your tradition and how to depict that story on a concrete wall in a flood channel in the San Fernando Valley, actually begin to find new power and actually begin to realize if I could do that on a wall with paint, I could do that with my words in a town hall. If I could do that with my words in a town hall, I could do that with these elected officials who are deciding on our fate, on our resources, on who's getting incarcerated and who's not. Right? And they began to realize that they had the power to change the equation. Now, every one of you in the work that you do all around the country, my friend Laura Zabel here from Springboard for the Arts in the Twin Cities, Michael Rode at ASU, all these people who are doing work that is not just place-based, but is really trying to activate power in every direction to change the game, change the story, and change the equation. All of you already know this in your bones, but one of the things that I wanted to do here today was to give you this framework so that you can go forth and tell the story of what it is that you're doing and make it that much more contagious. And the thing that I want to close with is this. One of the notions that I actually, that is early in, in, in my book, um, is a notion that is also, I think, somewhat hard for some people to get their minds around um, in the way that my claim that power is infinite can be hard for some folks. Uh, but I want to give it to you because it, it challenges us or invites us to kind of reckon with what we are and what we're doing here. And that is the notion, uh, as I say in the book, that power is a gift. I mean that in several senses. It is, a, it is an endowment. The power that we have in our lives as citizens, as participants, as contributors in community. Um, if you are raised in a faith tradition, um, you will have a sense in which we are endowed by our creator. If, like me, you weren't raised in a faith tradition, um, you displace that sense in a civic religious sense that um, we are endowed with a responsibility, right? But the power is a gift that we are endowed with. There's a second sense in which power is a gift, and that is the sense that particularly for those of us who intersect with the arts feel deeply, and that is the notion of a gift as a talent. You're a gifted painter. You're a gifted singer. You're a gifted poet, right? When we say someone is a gifted fill-in-the-blank, what we're really saying is, don't hoard, right? What we're saying is, you were given something, and it is now part of the social contract that you circulate what you were given, right? 
you were given that talent to sing, to build, to write, to imagine, to preach, to whatever it is. And now it is not just your opportunity, but it is your obligation to share and to circulate that. Right? And the third and final sense in which power is a gift is simply this. It is something that we are continuously giving away. Right? It is a resource that if we're unmindful of it, we are just, it's just like an open faucet. Right? If we are sloppy in the ways that we direct our attention, our fear, our hope, and we've been sloppy as a people. That's in part how this president, who is really expert at siphoning up attention, came to power. He took all of this loose, promiscuously given away power of attention, of concern, of fear, and he sucked it up. And that's why he is where he is. But this notion that power is a resource, if we are mindful of it, if we're mindful of the ways in which we are giving it, then we become intentional about, well, let's choose who we circulate it with. Let's choose how we circulate it. Let's choose the arenas and the timelines in which we will circulate it, right? And so this notion that power is a gift is one that I think is so fundamental because it fundamentally returns us to the theme that Jamie and Adam wanted us to really close with today, and that is this theme of responsibility. All of us here, whether you are, you know, and I've used this phrase a couple times now, citizen artist. Um, one of our big partners in this sphere besides Art Place America is the Kennedy Center um, and the Aspen Institute uh, Arts Program. And both of those institutions um, we've been working closely with in trying to popularize this notion of the citizen artist. And when I say citizen artist, I mean it in both directions. I mean the artist as citizen, thinking about what your responsibilities are as a creative artist, uh, what your responsibilities are to the wider community and to the country. But I also mean it uh, in the sense of citizens as artists, people who don't professionally identify themselves as creative artists, but who can and should be bringing to bear all of the modes of thinking and doing and being that all of you in this room instantiate every day to their lives, how to imagine, how to listen, how to break apart stuck frames of thinking, how to invite and include people into circles where they previously haven't been invited and included, how to create a world that you actually want to be part of, right? These are things that artists know, but these are things that now citizens in this time of both peril and opportunity for the republic, that citizens have to become quite literate in. And so our responsibility in understanding our power and understanding the gift that we have and becoming far more intentional in how we circulate and direct that gift to revitalize our communities and our country, our responsibility is simply this, to live like citizen artists. And in both of those directions, to bring to bear the imagination, the commitment, the creativity, the compassion, and the sense at the end of the day that artists are not an adornment. Artists are not an ornament to a practical society. Art, art making, artistry is the very essence, the fullest possible expression of citizenship because it is full body, full 360 human, humanity engaged participation in life. And we are not at the edges. We ought to be at the center of what it means to revitalize democracy. We have to be at the center of what it means to show people how to know your own mind, how to know your own heart, how to stand your ground, how to invite people into that ground, and how to face the future and face our fears and hopes together. Artists must teach the rest of us. And those of us who work with artists must help make that possible. I'm so grateful to spend this time with you today. And I hope that um, as you go forth into the rest of the country, you'll find uh, in the pages of the, bo of the book um, maybe some ideas. But hopefully, you'll take the book really as the beginning of a dialogue and a conversation. Uh, our work at Citizen University, as I say, um, is uh, work that's done all around the country. Um, and we work with organizations like uh, the Wildflowers Institute that Hen and Lou here uh, runs, and of course, uh, uh, so many other organizations represented here in this room. And I want to just extend this invitation in closing to play with us. Um, and uh, we're very findable on the internet, and findable on Twitter and social media, um, but mainly um, as you digest these notions and think about what it means for you to fully exercise and appreciate your power, to come back and circle back with us and say, I didn't agree with you on this, or I agreed with you on that, 
or I think because of what we read here, we could make something new, and we want to do that with you or with some other folks that you play with. Um, I don't see this uh, as a closing keynote where I'm going to go finish and, uh, and you're going to go off the conference. I see this as the beginning uh, of a chance for us all to play and create together for the good of community and our country. Thank you very much.